We're talking today, September 16th, with Charles Black, one of the leaders of the Atlanta Student Movement. Uh, Mr. Black, we're so glad that you're able to be with us today and able to share with us uh, your story for this project, Voices Across the Color Line. Well, thank you for doing it. Glad to have you. Um, and what I'd first like for you to do is give me some background information mm -hmm. on uh, your coming to Atlanta mm -hmm. and your coming uh, to be involved in the student movement. Okay, I'm from Miami, Florida originally and uh, I came to Atlanta to attend Morehouse College. Uh, while in Miami I was a regular church going boy. My parents were very, very religious, my father being um, a lay leader in the church and we went to church at least five to six times a week. And, uh, what so church was this? It's Church of Christ. Yeah, we had, uh, of course, Sunday school, morning service, uh, evening service, Tuesday night Bible class, and Thursday night song practice. Because we sang a cappella, so you had to sing all the songs by learning how to read the notes. Uh, so that was my upbringing. I was active in, in school, in high school. Uh, I was uh, president of the student body there. Uh, what school was that? Northwestern Senior High School in Liberty City, what got to be known as uh, a poverty, uh, riotous place uh, in later years. Uh, I didn't see this after I was growing up there, of course. But um, I declined an early admission scholarship to Morehouse College because I'd been elected student body president. I wanted to be a big man on campus for a year. Uh, but I came to uh, Morehouse in uh, 1958. and. Um, my first recollections of, of uh, arriving in Atlanta, which was my first time coming to the city, was by train uh, and passing a building as we entered the city that had a huge Confederate flag on the side of the building. Now, it may have been the state flag, but I know they hadn't, they hadn't done that at that time. They, uh, or had they, yes, they had. About two years earlier, they had replaced the uh, state flag that they had with one with the big Confederate stars and bars on it. And I saw this on the side of, uh, of a building. And uh, it was a big shock to me because I had just kind of assumed that those things were illegal. And sure enough, they were and still are. Um, but there was probably the display. So that was the first thing that I saw. And I noticed uh, cobblestone streets or streets made with uh, red brick and brick, buildings of red brick, which was very uncommon to my upbringing in Miami, where buildings were mostly uh, country block, sand and stone, that sort of thing. Um, I arrived at the terminal train station. Uh, which no longer exists. It's on the site where the Richard B. Russell building, federal building, is now. And uh, that was my first uh, memory of, of Atlanta. Uh, and the terminal train station building is significant and that uh, that was the first place that I sat in when we had our sit-ins um, on March 15, 1960. Um, I came to Morehouse in uh, 58, as I said, and during my stay there, I uh, served on the newspaper uh, staff, became editor in my junior year, and was editor again in my senior year. What uh, was the name of the newspaper? The Maroon Tiger. Um, and uh, I also was on the varsity debate team. I sang with the Atlanta Morehouse Spellman Chorus. Uh, and I was on the student court, minding my own business, you know, trying to learn a little something and date girls at Spellman. When uh, Monty King approached me one day in my junior year, and uh, said that uh, he and some folk had been talking about what had happened uh, in Greensville and uh, Greensboro, uh, and that he thought that they thought that we should do something here. And uh, he invited me to a meeting in Sale Hall Annex on Morris College's campus with, uh, I guess, about a dozen or so students, and we had our first meeting about this matter. Uh, it was he, uh, Julian Bond, and a guy named Sam Pierce who had had this conversation over at Yates and Milton Drugstore on the corner of what was Fair, is Fair Street and was uh, uh, Chestnut, now Brawley. Um, was this the Sam Pierce who became a judge? No. Okay. No. Uh, this was a, and I think it was Sam was his first name. Lonnie will correct that if that's, uh, if that's not correct. Um, but um, Lonnie had approached... Uh, the two of them, and, and I think the story goes that Pierce approached Lonnie first. It was he, he was the first to suggest that we should do something, and, uh, and Lonnie and uh, he 
breathe, and, and uh, they approach Julian Bond sitting there having a milkshake or whatever it is. And uh, Lonnie said something to the effect that, uh, you know, something like that ought to be done here. And Julian said, yeah, somebody ought to do something like that. <laughs> and Lonnie responded, that, no, I mean, we should uh, do this. And they were the beginning of, um, of the nucleus of a group that uh, came to be later the Atlanta Student Movement. Um, following our initial meeting on the Morehouse College campus, we reached out to student leaders on the other, other college campuses, uh, initially Spelman, our sister school and uh, then also uh, Clark College at the time, Morris Brown College, Atlanta University, the Interdenominational Theological Center. Um, those were the schools that existed at the time. I don't think I missed anybody. Uh, of course, uh, Clark and Atlanta University subsequently merged and became Clark Atlanta University. Um, but we had meetings then subsequently with student leaders from all of these campuses. Uh, we attempted to involve the student body presidents when we could in at least one or two cases. Uh, uh, we had uh, so much to decline in involvement, uh, student body president one, one or two of the schools. But we proceeded to make plans as to how we might do uh, this thing in Atlanta. Um, at some point, and I don't recall at whose initiation, um, uh, there was a meeting with the presidents of the, of the universities, the colleges in, in the Atlanta University Center. And I think it was uh, probably at the urging of uh, one of the presidents of the, of the colleges who had heard what we were talking about. Or Lonnie might have approached one of them, I'm not certain. He can tell you the fact on that. Uh, they suggested that it would be the prudent thing to do to uh, state our case publicly as to why we would be doing something like a sit-in so that people would understand uh, you know, what we were coming from. And that would, of course, ensure broader support for what we were doing. It made sense to us. And we prepared a document uh, that we called An Appeal for Human Rights, which appeared as a full-page ad in the local newspapers and in the New York Times. Um, and this uh, document set forth our dissatisfaction with uh, segregation in, in various areas, education, public accommodation, religion, and what have you. What kind of activities had you planned before you issued that appeal? We had planned to have a sit-in just like they had done in, in Greensboro. Okay. Uh, we thought that was a, a very uh, forceful, you know, uh, timely thing to do. Uh, they had done it there, it made sense to us. Uh, you know, there was generalized dissatisfaction, you know, with the fact that there was segregation and, uh, and uh, um, of course, second-class everything for, for blacks in the South. As far as we knew, only in the South, most of us, uh, because we were, for the most part, Southern-born uh, students. Um, we were largely, too, the second generation of uh, folk who had served in the military in World War I and World War II. World War II and um, they had come back, as you would recall, fighting for their country over overseas and found there that they were, in some instances, treated uh, like human beings in other places um, at the urging of white soldiers uh, were treated unkindly by uh, folk in the countries that they were there to help. Uh, but they came back with um, an attitude of um, some, something of defiance themselves. They felt that they should uh, have equal rights here. They could fight for those rights for others in other places. Uh, and we were the, the children of that generation to a great extent. So uh, I think we had a little bit of fire in our belly about the matter uh, that just needed to be stoked a bit. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, so here we were from all over the country, uh, mostly all over the southeast, in this insular environment, uh, a protected environment uh, of the Atlanta University Center, uh, where these schools were, although dependent to a great extent for financial help on, on uh, white sources, they were for the most part, uh, for the most part liberal northern white sources. Um, and uh, the, the presidents were mostly strong leaders, and uh, also faculty members were uh, very sharp uh, because these were the best and the brightest for the most part in the country because they weren't hired by the other universities. So they were available to these schools. And um, the Atlanta University Center uh, had pretty much the cream of the crop of black educators. Uh, so we had those role models and folk who talked to us about, uh, you know, uh, civil rights kinds of issues uh, in our day-to-day -day encounters with them and in classes as well. Uh, so we were ready for something like this. And after the document appeared in the papers, uh, the New York Times and the local newspapers here, it was only a week later that we had our first sit-in. 
uh, our city ends, which were on March 15th, as I said, of 1960. At that time, we had um, planned to sit in at exactly 11 o'clock uh, on that morning in 11 locations. Uh, the facilities that were picked were places that had um, some public connection uh, and that they were in federal buildings, uh, uh, train stations, or in places like uh, the major department stores, uh, Riches, uh, uh, what was Davison's at the time, now Macy's, um, uh, the five and ten kinds of places like Woolworths, places of that sort. Um, so we had a very tightly organized uh, plan of action that involved uh, about 200 students. Uh, most of them were the folk who would sit in, others were drivers, others were spotters who would be located at telephone booths that could see what was happening and call the office and report. What preparation did you all make for these sit-ins? Well, um, you know, one would perhaps assume that there had been a lot of non-violent training and, and uh, workshopping and that sort of thing um, in preparation for uh, our first it is, uh, we didn't really have that. We talked about it philosophically as to how we would approach these things. We would not strike back. Uh, we would uh, we would approach this in a nonviolent manner, although none of us were particularly steeped in the concepts of nonviolence or the principles or any of that, or Gandhi, uh, you know, I'd never heard of it. Uh, but uh, this um, appeared to be, to us, a sane and sensible um, approach to what we were doing. Uh, it didn't make any sense to go down there trying to fight the folk with all the guns and the power. <laughs> uh, and of course, you, uh, uh, you were a sympathetic figure if you were sitting there and folk were abusing you and all you are doing is asking for something they took for granted. Um, so it didn't take a lot of uh, training and persuading for us to, to use that approach. Did you have a good response from the various student bodies? They were well, how, how responsive were they to your initial request to take part in the, in the protest? That's a very good question because the, the, the responses vary quite a bit. Now, if you talk to probably any of those students now, they were all gung-ho and were the first ones online and uh, put their necks on the line. That was not the case at the time. Um, and I would not try to put uh, percentages on uh, the categories of responses, but uh, there were those who responded more or less readily, some who had to be talked to a, a bit, who, uh, who would respond favorably. But there were others who, who said they would not do that. They, were, uh, they had various reasons or excuses. Some were concerned about their parents' employment, particularly if they were local students. Uh, others were fearful of being hurt. And others uh, professed their reluctance with bravado. Well, I don't know what I might do. You know, well, we knew what they would do, nothing. but. Uh, it was that kind of a thing, and uh, there were those who used their uh, their purpose for being here as an excuse. You know, I'm here to learn and get my degree and get a good job, and you know, and uh, they were going to take time out of that uh, for for this. Um, so you know, the uh, reactions were pretty much across the board. Um, but we asked those who uh, declined the invitation to be a part of, of this effort uh, not to talk about it that we were doing this. So everybody was more or less sworn to secrecy. So that um, very few people outside of the 200 or so that were directly involved knew that this was going to happen uh, among the students or, or anywhere else off the campus or anywhere. So it was a, a almost a complete and total surprise uh, to the Atlanta community when the city took place. What was your role on that march, those first uh, sit-ins? Where, where, where did you go and what was that mm -hmm. protest like? I was uh, given uh, half of the uh, sit-in group for my first stop in Atlanta, the terminal train station. Uh, Martin Luther King's brother, uh, A.D. Williams King, had the other half of our group. The reason why we had, uh, we had the largest group of all of them because of the size and the configuration of the waiting room that we were going into at the, um, at the train station. There were two distinct kind of entrance areas and uh, of course we wanted to arrived with you know, more or less total surprise and, and disarm the, the folk and we needed to go into both of those doors essentially we, at, the, at the same time we needed two leaders for that and, and I forgot the size of our group but we had a, a fairly large group going in and that's where we went. Yeah. So, so what was your plan? To enter both the white and the black entrances? No, only, and, the white, uh, okay. only the white uh, okay. uh, areas, right. Uh -huh. Now in other 
uh, locations, there were no such thing as white and black. But at the, uh, the waiting rooms of train stations, of course, you had black waiting rooms and all. Mm -hmm. And um, department stores and, uh, and uh, dime stores, those sorts of places, you had lunch counters that blacks were not allowed to sit at. You could stand at the end and order something and take it away. Uh, but you could not sit down, but it was a single facility. Um, and, uh, and I think City Hall might very well have been on our list at that time as well. And uh, they had, you know, cafeteria that was whites only. Um, so we were going into white only kinds of facilities or seats. Uh, so what happened? Well, uh, our, this is our first uh, opportunity for levity uh, in, in the matter because uh, we, we found out later that uh, the Atlanta police were turning around in their cars in the middle of Peachtree Street all over the place because they would get another call, we got some here too. And uh, they had no knowledge that this was going to happen. They, they didn't know what to do. And they were calling, of course, their superiors at, uh, at the police department who were in, in turn talking to uh, the mayor's office and the like trying to decide how to respond uh, to this action. Uh, but that was going on in various places Well, we were in 11, diff 11 different locations. Right. <laughs> yeah, we were in 11 different locations. They were pretty much up and down Peachtree Street okay. um, and uh, in and environs. Of course, the train stations were not on Peachtree. There was a Union Station and Terminal Station. Uh, the Union Station was over near where uh, the, Atlanta, the, uh, the AJC headquarters are now. And the Terminal Station, as you know, was where the Russell Building is. Uh, but um, so we were in diverse locations, and and the police would receive one call and start out for that uh, location and get another, and, and they were just spinning around the middle of the street. Uh, what was finally decided by the city leadership, uh, uh, Hartsfield was the mayor at the time, that uh, they would tell us that we were trespassing and give us you know five minutes to leave, and if we did not leave, we would be arrested. Um, we had anticipated the possibility of arrest and had discussed that among the groups and, and our agreement among ourselves was those who were willing to be arrested, of course, would remain and be arrested. Those who preferred not to be arrested, if given the opportunity not to be arrested, uh, would leave but ought to do so. Okay. And then there were those who, if arrested, would be bailed out at the earliest possible time and others would be willing to, to stay. So we had all these uh, possibilities. Uh, it didn't probably work out that way for everybody because you may not have been, well, we didn't know if it was going to work out that way. We didn't know if we would be given an opportunity to leave or not. Uh, we would be arrested in mass, and all who had gone um, was, we were at least prepared for that possibility. Uh, we had uh, people available to uh, bail us out if, uh, you know, if need be. Uh, and that's an interesting part of the story as well. Um, so in advance, mm -hmm. you had contacts in the adult community. We had some contacts. Who were willing in the adult to provide community. resources right, for yeah, you. Yeah, and I can't uh, remember who was initially on board in that regard. Again, Lonnie's recall of these things is far superior to mine. Mm -hmm. um, but um, we ended up with a large number of people who eventually committed the uh, their homes as collateral, you know, to bail us out of jail. These strange students from all over the southeast they didn't know. Uh, they put their, their homes on the line, and others signed cash bonds or whatever to get us out of jail, uh, which was an extraordinary thing. Um, and the other part, jumping ahead a bit, when we uh, ended up boycotting uh, the downtown stores uh, after they refused to desegregate, uh, that, that boycott went on for close to a year. Uh, we called upon the black community to close their accounts with segregation and open accounts with freedom, and asked that folk would send us their richest credit cards, and they did, in very large numbers. And we put them in a safe deposit box somewhere until the end of the boycott. But uh, the students had gained that kind of uh, respect, you know, and regard by the community, that these were honorable people doing uh, an important thing, and uh, folk weren't supported in whatever way they could. And one of the ways they did was to send their credit cards in to the student movement leaders. Uh, which was, again, you know, truly extraordinary. I don't think you can get anybody to do that today, probably. <laughs> but they did. Uh, people did that in large numbers. Um, but the effect of our, um, our, our first efforts ended up with some of us in jail, uh, being convicted of trespassing, uh, and uh, being sentenced. Um, my uh, first sentence, as I recall, was to, 
Well, we were in, in the, uh, the city jail at first, and I'm not sure whether this was a first or a second time, but uh, yeah, the, the city jail was the filthiest place on earth uh, down on Decatur Street. They tore it down finally. Um, and there were mostly, you know, really vagrant kinds of people housed there uh, who had, you know, drunks or, you know, they, they committed minor kinds of crimes and they just throw them in there and I guess pretty much forget about them until they needed his space with somebody else, I don't know. But the place was truly filthy, and they they had us down there for a few days. But um, uh, in in my case, and in the case of several of us, we ended up being sentenced to ten days at the um, the city farm, which is a prison farm uh, kind of place out on a uh, location called Key Road or Keys Road, somewhere south of Atlanta. I don't know exactly where it is. I haven't been there again. Uh, <laughs> but uh, we were sentenced to ten days uh, on the farm, and we had to. Um, Get up at four o'clock in the morning or four thirty, some time there about, and the guys had to uh, chop weeds out of the collard green patch uh, field, and the girls had to peel potatoes. Uh, so we would see them on our way out and on our way back in, um, and they would keep us out there for you know a large part of the day doing that, and we come back in and eat this foul food, and we were all housed in one huge room with about five to seven hundred. Uh, uh, prisoners. Uh, All together? Bunk beds, yeah, just open space. Wow. Uh, some were bunk beds and they had more they had more um, inmates or whatever we were, would have been called than they had bunk beds. So they had huge stacks of mattresses, which of course had been wet on and everything for many times. And you'd just get one of those and put it on the floor and maybe there would be enough sheets to put on, at least cross the top of them or something to, to sleep on. What was the reaction of the prisoners to you all? Well, that was interesting because they did have uh, televisions in the uh, in that huge space, a couple of TVs that everybody could watch, so they knew who we were. And uh, they were mostly blacks. I think they may have been all black in that room. Okay. I'm not certain. I not thought about that. Mm -hmm. But uh, maybe they were all black. Uh, and they they appreciated what we were doing. Uh, so there were those of, in the group who made a point of protecting us from other less savory people. Um, so we had no no physical problems of any kind while we were there. We were only there for about four days before there was such a, an uproar in the community uh, that um, they demanded, the city demanded we be released, and the mayor uh, had us released after about four days. Um, but it was not a pleasant experience. Was there any freedom song singing? Yeah. Well, in the jail we didn't. Uh, I don't recall that we were. We were singing, we were kind of scattered in the population for one thing. Uh, we attempted that out in the field, mm -hmm. and uh, the guards said, stop that singing. Mm -hmm. uh, so A.D. would um, would start uh, humming. And we'd, we'd start humming along, he'd stop that humming, and then you start whistling. <laughs> stop that whistling, right? Uh, so they wouldn't The guard was that. black or white? More, more white, yeah. guard was white. Oh, yeah, all the, all the staff was white. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but uh, the AD ended up uh, not doing much work because he would stand and tell jokes to this guard and he was standing there laughing and, uh, <laughs> while the rest of us were chopping weeds. And, who were some of know. the other uh, students or, yeah, students uh -huh. who had gone with you Well, and were, uh, in, were in jail with you? Okay, I'm, I, I'm not certain of who all was in jail at the, the, this time with me, but uh, some of the, uh, the students who were very active from the start were uh, Frank Holloway, who we call Big Frank, there was Frank Smith, we called Little Frank. Uh, Big Frank was about 6'5", or you know, 245, 50 pounds or whatever, played football. Um, and uh, a number of other guys, uh, they stand out of my mind because they were with me all the time. Uh, it seems uh, Danny Mitchell, uh, uh, let me see, those two guys were both, um, Big Frank was from Mars Brown, Little Frank was from Morehouse, uh, Danny Mitchell from Clark. Uh, the ladies were always the, the stalwarts, you know, in, in number and reliability. There would be more Spelman students in particular uh, than, than anybody else. Who, of all the demonstrators, uh, the, there were more women and from yeah. Spelman. There were more from Spelman than the other schools, uh, okay. Clark being second. Uh, the Long Sisters stand out in my mind from Clark, for example, and, uh, and, uh, and Lydia Tucker. Brown Douglas, uh, also from Clark. Um, from Spelman, there was Marion Wright Edelman, who we all know now. Was she arrested that 
that same day? That I don't recall. Okay. I don't recall. Um, there was Herschel Sullivan. Mm -hmm. uh, there was uh, Rosalind Poe. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Marion uh, Price. Uh, Ruby Doris Smith. Mm -hmm. uh, Mary Ann Smith. Um, a lot, yeah, her sister, right? Her, um, long list of uh, folk that was. Um, uh, Andrew Borders. Um, I don't know, there's a long list. Of okay. Folk. How do you account yeah. for the fact that the women were the stalwarts of the student movement protests? Well, I hate to say it, but if you ever want to get anything done, you better have some women involved. It just seems to work out that way. Any effort I've ever been involved in to this day, and the women do the heavy lifting. You know, we'll, we'll make some speeches, and, you know, some of us will be there when the die is cast. Uh, but the, in, in my encounters, anyhow, over these few years of my life, uh, the women always do most of the work. Yeah, I don't know why that is, but it's always the case. The guys would come largely because the women were going to be there. <laughs> I mean, that was the case then, you know, mm -hmm. and that, that's still the case. And volunteer organizations and all that you have now, mm -hmm. you know, if uh, there are some women involved, you know, some guys going to come along. Not that some of us aren't really just truly committed and yeah, not working for it too, course. but by the numbers, yeah. uh, the women seem to always be the, the more reliable. Mm -hmm. So what ha so what happened? You all finally got out of jail. And yeah, and you know, there were other times we were arrested again, or different people were arrested. Mm -hmm. uh, over, over a period time. of over days. Over a period of, yeah, and months, weeks and months. months yeah. Yeah. Okay. And we called for a boycott, as I said, of downtown Atlanta. And our, our prime focus was Rich's department store. And the reason for that was because Rich's was everybody's favorite store. You know, everybody loved Rich's. You know, white folk, black folk, everybody loved Rich's. And Rich's had a, a uh, motto that they actually lived by. And the motto was, no sale is ever complete until the customer is satisfied. And what that meant literally was, if you bought something from Rich's, and for any reason you want to take it back, they take it back. That could be 10 years later. 15, 16 years later, I mean, this actually happened in some cases. Uh, I, my sister, in years later, happened to be working at Richards, and somebody brought an iron back that they hadn't sold in the store for 16 years. And uh, she was asked her manager, you know, which this lady said, this iron doesn't work anymore. She said, take it back. You know, they gave her an exchange or her money back or something. Mm -hmm. But they lived by that, that motto, and, um, and folks just love Riches. And you had the pink pig at Christmas time, you know, and you had the... Santa's secret shop where you could carry your kids and leave them for an hour to shop for their presents. It was just a great store. But you couldn't sit at the lunch counters. You know, there was some, some place in Riches, as I call it, Black Skitty, uh, probably down in the basement somewhere. Uh, but at the other places in the Magnolia Room with the white tablecloths and all, you, you, could, not, you could not sit there. Um, and pretty much, as, you know, we knew that as Riches went, so would go the rest of uh, the facilities downtown. So they were our major, major focus. And the boycott, as I said, went on for, you know, a, a, about a year. And things came to a head. Well, during the time of the, the picketing and all down there, we had some fun because the Klan decided to picket us, to counter picket us. Uh, and they showed up in their, in their robes and their overalls and, uh, and their, their funny hats. And, and they would picket us. Uh, and then after a couple of days, um, they started showing up with uh, shirts and ties on. And their robes. And a guy from uh, the, the because newspaper, that's how you all were dressed. That's what we were dressed, right? And uh, and uh, the newspaper man asked the leader of the group at the time. He said about that, why the change? And his exact quote was, "We wanted to show these students we's dignified too." <laughs> so we had a lot of fun with that. But uh, we didn't take them uh, as as seriously as they thought we should. Mm -hmm. um, I remember they had some pretty robes. Some of them, you know, mostly white robes, but they were. Like one would have a satin green robe, and one would have a yellow, or you know, some of the red and mm -hmm. blue. And I went up to one of those guys. That sure is a pretty robe. Where'd you get that thing? Where can I get one of those? Right. So we were irreverent to them. So they, after a while, they just stopped picking us. Mm -hmm. But it was good for our for our cause that they were there because the folk who didn't stay away because of us stayed with me because of them, mm -hmm. and it, it rendered the um, the boycott uh, extraordinarily uh, effective and mm -hmm. successful. In spite of the fact that stores try to get people to come down after closing hours to shop, uh, shop by phone, you'll deliver it to your house, 
and, and all that sort of thing. And mm -hmm. Some people, of course, bought into that mm -hmm. in our community, but uh, mm -hmm. uh, we were able to sustain the boycott because we found out that it was, in fact, very, very successful. And particularly as you were going into the Christmas season? Well, we were approaching the Easter season uh, when uh, the, the boycott. Out. Well, no, when, when the boycott was kind of waning. Oh, okay. We had gone through the Christmas season and that point. Oh, okay. Things were still hot and heavy at that point. We had good, strong support, and nobody was, was talking about quitting uh, the effort. Um, but as the Easter season approached, um, you know, you would have fewer people show up for picket lines and all that, and folk were wanting to go buy those little dresses for their, their little girls and all for Easter and all that. So there was some uh, moaning and groaning about, uh, you know, giving up the boycott. Mm -hmm. And um, the... Um, some of the adult leadership and, uh, and Lonnie and some others uh, got talked into some meeting with, with the folk. It was at a time, I was not in that meeting, so I don't know exactly what happened, but uh, my recollection is that Lonnie went to this meeting to negotiate uh, with an understanding that the, this was going to be something of an open negotiation, but found out afterwards that some of the adult uh, folk had already agreed to a deal uh, with, with the folk and they were going to end the boycott. All right, so he, he ends up buying into whatever this agreement was. Well, there was a terrible outcry, um, and the students, you know, were all upset, and, and others in the community. And the, the result of all this was a major mass meeting at uh, Mount Moriah. Uh, I'm sorry, War, War Memorial. Memorial. I keep doing that. War Memorial, across the street from each other. Mm -hmm. War Memorial uh, Methodist Church, um, where um, Reverend Stinson was the, uh, the minister there. We had this mass meeting that was so big that the church overflowed out into the parking lots and the sidewalks and out in the street and every, everywhere. They set up microphone uh, loudspeakers outside. And it was a very contentious uh, environment because we had uh, Daddy King and Weed Homes Borders and, 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 uh, and folk like that, um, you know, arguing for the boycott being over. We made our point. And, uh, you know, All of the adults, <laughs> including Borders, were, were for ending the boycott. Yeah, Daddy King. Okay. Were there any um, adults that sided with the students? Well, you had uh, you had like a three-tier age situation. Uh, you had the older folk like Daddy King and Borders and uh, John Calhoun and and uh, A.T. Uh, A. Walden, uh, Colonel Walden, uh, Warren Cochran, and uh, 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 we, uh, Dobbs, Maynard's grandfather, uh, John Wesley Dobbs. And, and folk of that that age group, and then you had the younger folk like Jesse Hill, and Clarence Coleman, and Johnny Johnson, and um, um, you know various others, uh, Carl Holman, and uh, people of their age group who were uh, considered like the Young Turks. They would have been in their thirties or so, I think, at, at the time. Um, and uh, so they would tend more to side with us. Uh, and of course, our attorney uh, Donald Hollowell. Uh, got us out of jail all the time. Um, he was a, a bit older, but, you know, a good guy. So we had, we had formed what was called the Adult Student Liaison Committee, and we would meet on a regular basis with the, well, these three tiers of, uh, of, of, of the students, the Young Turks, and the the Old Guard, we called them. Some some were called the Katons. Uh, but uh, we would meet over Atlanta Life in a little outbuilding they had and discuss what we were planning to do, and they'd try to talk us out of doing certain things, and we would, you know, discuss it, and, and with the understanding that we would decide for ourselves after we left what we would or would not do. Um, and that's the way it worked. And this, this culminating mass meeting um, resulted in uh, the old guard, you know, arguing that the board got shit in. And uh, Lonnie, having been beat up on by the rest of us, uh, trying to be somewhat neutral in the situation, but um, calling for uh, a reconsideration of that matter. And there were those who were arguing that, uh, you know, we need to see this thing to the end. And the most memorable moment, one of the most memorable moments uh, for me was seeing a middle-aged kind of a woman walk down the middle of the aisle. She was dressed in a white uniform, so I don't know if she was a nurse or somebody else who wore a white uniform with the white shoes and, and the like. And she went up to in front of the podium and shook her finger in the face of, you see, the borders of King who was speaking. And she challenged him and said, you are my minister. Say, I want to hear you tell me to go back to, 
down to riches. She was defying him that uh, she insisted we should not be going. And, um, and she walked and shook her finger up at her, her minister and challenged him to, uh, you know, to ask them to go back downtown. That was a big moment. Well, the short of it all is that uh, there was pretty much chaos in the, in, in the forum. I mean, uh, uh, there was a lot of contention there. It's a very unsettled situation. So Lonnie and I and, and Julian, as I recall, uh, caught us over to the side, try to decide what we'd be doing, what we're going to do about this, this situation. And, um, you mean at this point, people were shouting out. There was no order. Well, yeah, there in was some shouting out, but there was there was more order than you would uh, you would probably have today, okay. because you know we were more respectful in those days of each other and kind of our elders and all. So there would there would be some of that, but you hear the, the roar in the audience, you know, the unsettledness that you would hear, the whispering and uh, and grumbling sort of thing. Would be that, and uh, the older folk trying to quell the audience, and Lonnie's trying to quell the audience and, and the like. Um, and he had some other students, I think, speak perhaps Herschel, who was his vice, the vice chairman of our group at the time, and some others. But uh, we knew that this wasn't working, and we needed to decide. Maybe we needed something to do, so we decided that we needed Martin Jr. to come and speak to the group. Now his daddy is already up there, telling him, but we need to go back downtown. Uh, so Lonnie places the call to Martin, who was at home in bed asleep, because he had just returned from Alabama from a long trip to Alabama. So he was tired and he was asleep in bed. And so Lonnie convinced him that we needed him to get out of the bed and come down there and talk to this, this audience, which he did. And uh, he spoke to the audience and uh, in his profound way, this to me was the greatest speech he ever made, uh, totally extemporaneously, you know. And he talked about Moses and God and whoever all else and, and all the, uh, the principles and, and about the, you know, and he quieted the crowd down. Uh, and uh, spoke to the to the advantages of this and the disadvantages of the other. And at the end of, of the evening, uh, many people could probably not tell you which side he had come down on. Because here, you know, his daddy is sitting right be behind him. He doesn't want to defy his father in the front of this audience. And he also doesn't want to break with the students. Um, he had not he had not wanted to be involved in the Atlanta civil rights activities largely because his father didn't want him to be involved in Atlanta, and the other folk of his father's generation uh, had the attitude, you know, we don't need Junior here. You know, we got two dozen of him in us, in essence, and uh, they encouraged him not to get involved in the, uh, the Atlanta student movement. It movement and uh, and uh, we pushed for him to get involved, and he did walk, march with us, go to jail, and, and the like, prior to this time. Um, largely at Lonnie's urging, you know, you, know, you can't leave from behind that kind of argument and stuff. Mm -hmm. We finally got involved. But I want to know something about the structure of the student movement. Lonnie King, was this something that he had been elected to do as leader? Well, uh, who were the other officers? Yeah. And I understand at one point you had be, you succeeded uh, Lonnie in the leadership. Right. How did that happen? What was the um, structure? Lonnie was the founding chairman uh, and was, uh, you know, in effect, the 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 chairman by acclamation from the start because he was the one leading all this effort and organizing it. And so we did elect him chairman. And we had a vice chairman who was, um, my recollection is that it was Herschel Sullivan from, uh, from Spelman, I believe, at the time. And we had a secretary and, uh, and we had a, um, a, a, later we had an executive secretary type who kind of ran the office. And that was Julian uh, under both our administrations. Um, and he did PR kinds of stuff, uh, press releases and all that. Um, but that was, you know, pretty much the structure. But we had representation from all the all the campuses. We made a point of always having, you know, all all of the campuses represented. Um, I succeeded Lonnie as chairman um, when he uh, was leaving to go to, to uh, law school. When was that? That would have been in um, in um, sixty one. Uh, it would have been the summer of '61, as I recall. Okay. I had so gone he really, home. Uh, he he was excuse, excuse me. me. He was just the leader for about a year then. Um, from the spring yeah. of '60. Well, actually, through. we started we started our efforts in around around uh, February of '60, mm -hmm. and uh, until the summer of '61, so like a year and a half or so. Okay. And I and I succeeded him for about a year and a half. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, so, um, and uh, was it by acclamation? 
No, it was interesting because uh, I had, uh, at this point, I had gone home for the summer uh, to Miami at some point, and, um, and I'm not remembering the order of all these things, but when I had come back, um, the students had gotten involved in the political campaign, which I opposed uh, uh, our group doing, but uh, the students were supporting M.M. M. Muggsy Smith for mayor. Uh, this was the race that Ivan Allen was in, Lester Maddox, Charlie Brown, uh, Milton Farris. There were, uh, I think, six candidates for mayor. Uh, those other guys whose names you might not recognize were either city councilmen, or city aldermen, or on the county commission. Mm -hmm. And Lester Maddox, of course, our resident racist. Uh, and, Why uh, did the students support Muggsy Smith? They, I don't know at whose initial urging the students got involved, uh, but the Young Turks were, you know, supporting Muggsy, and he had, in 1948, introduced legislation in the state legislature to unmask the Klan, and had been considered a liberal kind of a legislator, especially for the day, um, and um, and for whatever reason, they decided he was the the most liberal of the bunch. In those days, you didn't have the option of voting for black candidates, that would be fruitless. Mm -hmm. So our options were to try to select the, the lesser of the evils. That was the common expression that we had. We were always trying to choose the lesser of the evils of two evils. Um, and Ivan Allen was chairman of the uh, uh, Chamber of Commerce at the time and had his, um, his office supply company, Ivan Allen, mm -hmm. office supply company. Uh, Les Maddox had his pit rig restaurant. Why were you opposed to the student movement getting involved in the local election? Well, I didn't think that we should be involved in partisan politics. I thought that we should stick with, uh, you know, strictly civil rights kinds of, uh, of issues. Um, that was not what we should have been doing. We should have continued with uh, uh, desegregation, voter registration, employment, opportunity kinds of things, uh, apart from partisan politics. Um, now, of course, the, the city elections were not partisan in the Democratic-Republican sense because they were always nonpartisan elections, but it's partisan in terms of the candidates. Mm -hmm. In any event, the, um, Lonnie had gotten the students all involved in this race, and when I got back, you know, we'd done all this thing. And in the midst of all this is when I, I got elected chairman, um, and uh, I wanted to extract the students from that involvement, mm -hmm. um, which I did by insisting we were not going to support any candidate, uh, but we would get the folk out to vote. But what had happened was that uh, the older establishment, had, the black community was totally split among all these candidates, except for Lester. Nobody supported Lester, but you know, you had black preachers with Charlie Brown. You had uh, the Auburn Avenue establishment with Ivan Allen. You had some folk with Milton Farris because they knew him for whatever reason. Some with, with uh, Jim Aldridge, uh, you know. Uh, so they were kind of scattered all over the place. But the, the 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 largest, strongest part of the established black community was with Ivan Allen, and the students and the Young Turks were with Muggsy Smith. Uh, the end effect was that uh, we ended up with a runoff between Ivan Allen and Lester Maddox. Um, and uh, at this point, you know, the question is, you know, what the students going to do? Because we had delivered uh, like 15 to 17,000 votes that they had for Muggsy Smith. Um, and that was a large, large number of votes at that time because you, you'd have uh, a little less than 100,000 votes, perhaps, and uh, Lester Maddox could count on 30,000 or so from white races anytime he ran for anything. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was a significant number of votes. Um, so my position was that we would um, we would not support a candidate, but we would encourage people to go to the vote if it was clear uh, the distinction between the candidates. Now, understand that the Atlanta Enquirer newspaper had been started out of our movement, and uh, the paper had taken the position that there was no difference between Lester Maddox and Ivan Allen. Uh, and uh, Maurice Pennington, who was the editorial cartoonist, had drawn a picture of the two of them, editorial cartoon, in one suit. And it said, cut from the same cloth. <laughs> okay. But that had profound impact, you know, in getting votes for Muggsy Smith, you know, during the, the primary part of, of, the, of the election. So now we have this runoff, and we are out there with this picture of Lester and Ivan being the same. So why should people go back to the polls, right? So I uh, had a meeting with uh, Lester Matt, I with Ivan and Allen, uh, I and maybe three other members of my group uh, at Carolyn Longbank's father's house, 
in his den and with Ivan Allen King, uh, Helen Bullock. <coughs> Helen Bullock had been executive secretary for uh, Hartsville and she ended up being executive secretary for Ivan Allen and for uh, Sam Marcel. Well, she came with Ivan and she was his, his chief advisor. And we sat and talked, and, and my position was that, uh, you know, the black community, folk who had listened to the students, uh, had no reason, they saw no reason why they should, you know, go to the post both for either one of them, because they were the same, they have been painted as the same. And so the only way that they would want to go back, the only way I would encourage them to go back, was if he made a clear distinction between the two of them. And I had a little list of about six or seven things that I wanted him to take a public position on. And, uh, and he was, you know, arrogant and defiant about that. And he said, you know, you have to do that. I mean, you know, they all going to vote for Les Maddox. I said, well, we got a third option. And he said, what is that? I said, we can go fishing. Mm -hmm. yeah, I said, if we go fishing, you lose. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah, but I heard about you. Yeah, but you lose, right? And, and Helen Bullock says, so now I have him. <laughs> Maybe you ought to listen to what he's saying. And at the result of that little meeting was he agreed to go public commitments on these on these things, uh, desegregation of uh, facilities at City Hall, uh, employment of blacks, and, you know, some other things we had. I don't remember some voter registration kinds of things. I don't know what they were. But he took a public stand on those matters. And the uh, as a result of that, the students turned out the black vote in large numbers, and he, he defeated less than matters. That's how he was elected. Um, I don't know how we got off on that. But it was during this period that I was, I was elected uh, chairman, mm -hmm. you know, in the midst of this... Uh, this campaign. Now, I was not elected as the second chairman. I served as the second chairman. Now, the group had elected Frank Smith while I was in, in, in Florida on vacation. Well, Lonnie didn't think that Frank Smith was the right guy to lead the group. Now, Frank was a little bit hot-headed and all that. Strong guy and all that. He was a little hot-headed. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Lonnie just manipulated a new election and, and got me elected as, uh, as, as, <laughs> as the second chairman. Uh, which, which is funny. Uh, but that's that's where we were through that point. And during my administration, um, we focused. Well, we had we had the uh, we had the obligation of effecting the desegregation that we had fought for in public accommodations. We we finally had reached uh, an agreement that they would desegregate their facilities, uh, but it's going to be by a, a, a point certain. And so I had to organize the first people to go to the different facilities. Um, you know, at, at at specific times that we had. And of course, all those folk that in the in the black community leadership who had fought us the hardest wanted to go to Magnolia Ballroom. I mean, Magnolia uh, Restaurant. What's it called? Restaurant. Magnolia Room and Riches, which was the nicest you know dining facility of all of them. But I made a point of not letting them go. <laughs> I sent mostly students and other adults who had been more supportive uh, to those places. They had to go somewhere. Else. Um, but uh, that's one of the things we did. And then we we ended up on a um, a campaign to desegregate the theaters, uh, and uh, there were about eight owners of all the theaters in, in town at the time. And uh, during Lonnie's time, while I was uh, before I went to uh, to Miami for my uh, summer uh, vacation, um, a letter had been sent to these guys, you know, asking them to meet with us to desegregate the theaters and all that, and uh, they hadn't responded. Well, when I when I came back, you know, I made a contact again and referred to an earlier letter which, of course, I couldn't find a copy of. Uh, so they all said they never got any such letter, and I couldn't prove they had so. But anyhow, we did proceed with um, uh, picketing of the, of the theaters, uh, and we had uh, white folk who would buy tickets and give them to black folk who would try to go into the theater and be denied and all that. Uh, so we had a, a boycott going, and we were entering a rainy part of the, the year, and had gotten some signs beautiful signs made and had them laminated, you know, waterproofed and everything. And um, and we had a relationship with uh, Helen Book. I could call her any time. And we usually would kind of let them know what we were doing, uh, what we planned to do, in an effort to negotiate if we could, uh, you know, uh, the uh, the end of whatever it was, rather than having to go through all this. Uh, so she asked, and I told her, we got our signs ready, and they're waterproof, we're ready to go on this, to an extended boycott. Uh, she said, well, let me talk to, um, to, um, it was still, um, no, it was still, uh, Hartsfield was still uh, mayor at the time. Um, and let, let me see if I can get him to get the owners into a meeting. Uh, so she asked for a week, of course, the students chomping at the bit. You know, a week 
<laughs> you know, we a week, no, we're ready to go. So, uh, so we continued some of our activities uh, without intensifying them. And so, you know, it's, it's the mayor, you know, a week, we can give him a week, right? So at the end of a week, she called and said that uh, the owners had agreed to uh, a meeting, but it was going to be a week later. Uh, so the students, of course, were very anxious again about that. So I, I spent all my energies trying to keep the students from, uh, you know, uh, defying this this opportunity. So they did allow us to proceed with waiting for another week. And we met with the owners. Um, they all came to the meeting and said that they, you know, I got 15 minutes. You know, I got to go, and well, I got another meeting, and nobody had more than 20 minutes to stay. Well, we stayed for four hours. I think it was either three or four hours. Uh, Hartsfield chaired the meeting. He had at his side um, Chief of Police uh, Herbert Jenkins and Richard Rich. Now, at this point, uh, Rich's had, had already segregated his facility. You know, a little time had passed, so he was able. You know, the, the the owners were saying things like, you know, we have uh, blacks at our theaters. People are going to uh, riot. Somebody's going to yell fire. There's going to be a stampede. You know, there'll be stink bombs thrown and so, you know, and all this stuff. Uh, which was good to have the chief of police in there. I said, well, I'm sure that uh, Chief Jenkins can assure us he can maintain law and order in the city. Can't you, Chief? <laughs> to which, of course, he responded, yes. But the mayor was able to call upon Richard Rich to attest to the fact that none of these things had happened at his store after he had desegregated. And, and Richard Rich said, I wish I had done it much earlier. We lost a lot of money unnecessarily. You know, we should have done this much sooner. So we negotiated the desegregation of the theaters in that one meeting. Um, and uh, it, uh, the actual desegregation of the theaters coincided with the coming of the Metropolitan Opera at the Fox. Uh, of course, students didn't like that either because we had to wait another few weeks or so for that, that event. But um, we did that. And there were no tickets available, of course, to black folk because those tickets had been grandfathered down through generations among, among whites. So some of the, the whites gave up their tickets for blacks who could afford to buy them, like T.M. Alexander and, and some of those people, they bought some of those tickets and they were the first to go to uh, to the Fox and that was the first desegregation of the theaters. And then on a, a, a following day of that same week, I believe it was, we had um, agreed that we would send X number of, of students, of blacks, to all of these theaters at various points in time that we agreed to. And uh, we assigned people to do all that. And of course, you know, we had limited resources and, and uh, very few cars, so some of our people were running late getting to the theaters. So I'm getting phone calls from the owners asking, where are my people? <laughs> you know, you promised me four people here by 210, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, but that, that desegregation went on very smoothly and there were no, no big incidents. And, and that was that. And the, the other thing that we focused on... Uh, I'm trying to think what year was this. That would have been in, um, in 61, still, 61. I think. Um, so a lot happened in 60, 61. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, I think that would have been still in 61. Okay. Um, we had a, uh, next thing we focused on was a major uh, voter registration campaign uh, where we registered either that summer or the next summer um, large numbers, you know, thousands and thousands of uh, new black voters in connection with uh, an organization called the All Citizens Voter Registration Committee, which Jesse Hill had headed. At the time, the students uh, were the, the late work. Yeah, much what was the group. nature of how did they go mm -hmm. about registering or encouraging people to register? Well, we, we went around and knocked on doors. Uh, and uh, we had flyers and all, and we'd pass them out, but we would actually knock on the doors of the folk and go in and talk to them. And uh, we had some strange reactions. I remember kind of an elderly lady uh, over in the fourth ward somewhere. And, um, I don't know if she was um, sick or drunk or what, but she was laying on the bed. And you come in, you know, the door's open, you just walk in and start trying to talk to her. And she said very proudly that she had never voted and she would never vote. And she was very, very proud of it. And, you know, those it was hard to deal with. <laughs> you know, you didn't know what to do with those. So we were discouraged sometimes with people who, who were just adamant about not voting. Mm -hmm. um, but we were able to, to, to register, and again, I don't remember the numbers. Jesse could probably tell you better. Mm -hmm. uh, but some few tens of thousands, I think. Mm -hmm. It was at least ten to fifteen thousand, and maybe even a lot more, mm -hmm. in that in that one summer. I guess I want to go back a little mm -hmm. to the uh, presidential campaign, mm -hmm. uh, Nixon and uh, Kennedy, and the involvement of mm -hmm. King and his arrest and mm -hmm. riches. Do you have mm -hmm. any special recollection of, 
of that? Um, I was not directly involved. Lonnie was there. Um, Carolyn Longbanks, I think, was a part of that arrest, Marilyn Price and others. But uh, I'm not sure that was the one uh, that uh, precipitated the call. Maybe it was. But I know that he was he was uh, arrested once when he was for driving an Alabama a car with an Alabama license mm -hmm. uh, plate on it, and he had an Alabama license or something, uh, or he was driving a Georgia car. Mm -hmm. um, because I went to that 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 trial, it was in the downtown Decatur courthouse, the old courthouse in Decatur, mm -hmm. and it was quite interesting because the judge made a point of sitting sideways to the bench, reading a comic book throughout the whole. Uh, defense uh, presentation, and uh, when he finished, he just turned around and said, "Are you finished?" Well, yes, yes, Your Honor. That'll be four months in jail. And I think it was that arrest mm -hmm. that uh, precipitated the call from um, from Kennedy mm -hmm. that Nixon's folk had advised him to make, and um, or he had been advised not to make. He wanted to, and uh, many feel that that turned the tide of the the election. Mm -hmm. um, Blacks had uh, continued to vote Republican up through that period, you know, right. uh, in, in most places, and and, and quite interestingly, uh, in every major city, my recollection is, blacks voted for Kennedy, except Atlanta. Mm -hmm. Blacks still voted uh, Republican through that election, mm -hmm. um, because you know it's just been a very strong Lincoln mm -hmm. uh, loyalty kind of thing going through mm -hmm. that period. I was thinking about when the students. I uh, particularly Lonnie, had gotten King to agree to meet mm -hmm. them at the Regis Pro. This was before Regis right. had, had relented. Mm -hmm. uh, and then that arrest, I think, triggered a lot. And the, all the, even well, the it, decision uh, to go uh, into Regis around the presidential, to get involved in yeah, the presidential yeah, politics. Yeah, my recollection is that was his first involvement locally mm -hmm. um, when he was arrested that, that time at Regis. Mm -hmm. and, and Lonnie can talk more specifically about that mm -hmm. because he was there. But um, I wanted to ask you, were you at the uh, Raleigh conference? No, I was not. You were not? No, I was not. No, okay. I not mm -hmm. uh, so did you have any uh, direct or indirect involvement with the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee? Well, yes. Uh, they, um, what the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee was, as you know, was uh, a coordinating group of, of the leadership of all the movements that have been started across the South. Mm -hmm. um, they ended up with their headquarters in Atlanta because none of these movements had much money except Atlanta's. We paid the rent for uh, SNCC for at least the first year or so. And where did Atlanta's uh, money come from? We got contributions um, from all over the country and some from, from out of the country um, we, because we were in the news a lot for what we were doing mm -hmm. and folks sent us money, a lot of local money. but. Uh, money from uh, around the country. Okay. I, I, re I specifically remember when I was chairman receiving a correspondence from somewhere in Europe addressed just to me, Charles Black, Atlanta, Georgia. And I got it. It was delivered to me. We were, we were that uh, mm -hmm. uh, notable at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, people knew who we were. So we had a lot of, a lot of contributions. And uh, so we had more money than the others did. So we provided SNCC a base of operation initially. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that uh, that uh, we did with SNCC, well, SNCC didn't have uh, a whole lot of people uh, as such. They had, had people who were on staff who were, you know, kind of, a, well, they were hired by, by SNCC as staff people. Uh, so there weren't nearly as many of them as there were volunteer students like ourselves. But we would work with various ones of them in, 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 in efforts. For one, we had this major uh, march on the state capitol. We had had attempts to desegregate the facilities there and all that. And uh, the governor, Ernest Vandiver, had issued, uh, as we were marching, you know, by the thousands, to the state capitol, he issued an executive order outlawing protests on state property. And uh, so when we got there, well, before we got there, uh, he had brought every state trooper from around the state into Atlanta and had them stand shoulder to shoulder with billy clubs around the whole block of the capitol their cars parked bumper to bumper all around the block. The city of Atlanta uh, police and mayor uh, were concerned for our safety. They thought we were going to get beat up if we went down there. So uh, Lonnie was leading the first half of the march and I was leading the second half of the march. So um, the police chief um, convinced Lonnie 
uh, that they should not go down there uh, because there was going to be violence. And we hadn't had any widespread violence in Atlanta. Um, and so Lonnie decided to divert um, his part of the march over to a, a church and they had, had a rally. Well, the word came back down to, um, to me as to what was happening. So I turned my half of the march from the route we were going down another street and came up the other side to the other side of the Capitol over where the, the church is on the corner from the Capitol. Mm -hmm. So they didn't know we were coming. And I got right up to the, the, uh, the sidewalk with my few thousand people and, um, and confronted the, uh, the troopers at the time. But uh, I was mentioning SNCC because uh, Jim Foreman was the executive secretary of SNCC at the time and he and, and I co-led this section of the march actually. And um, so they stopped us there, would let, not let us go across. But I sent uh, word in that I'd like to meet with the governor. Uh, so whoever went in and they told him, and he agreed to meet with uh, with me and, and Jim. Okay. Mm -hmm. Hold on. Okay, you were talking about the, uh, the second half of that uh, march to the Capitol. Can you keep going with that? Yeah, um, Lonnie's group was turned and they went uh, to a church and uh, for a rally, you know, and uh, you know, they were going to decide, I suppose, what else they were going to do. Um, but I turned my group and, and went around another way and came up to directly across the street from the Capitol. And uh, they stopped us there and uh, I had stepped off the curb and we had signs and all, picket signs, um, and a state trooper uh, came across with his billy club and pushed me in the stomach with the billy, billy club and said, get back up on that curve, boy. Uh, so we, we sent a um, word over to the governor's office asked for a meeting with the governor. And uh, after some time, um, whoever it was came back and said that the governor had agreed to meet with, with me and, and Jim Foreman from SNCC. Uh, but we had to leave our signs open. Uh, nobody else could go. So the two of us went over. And the, uh, the governor interrupted whatever conference he was in, uh, Ernest Vandiver, and, uh, and received us in his office. So when we went in, I, you know, I thanked him for receiving us, you know, without an appointment and everything. And, uh, and I commented on the fact that he had issued this um, executive order um, outlawing uh, any protests on, on uh, state property. And I wanted to ask that he would rescind that executive order and in its place issue a new executive order outlawing all segregation in the state of Georgia. And his response was, that's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. <laughs> so I loved that moment. Uh, but we chatted for a while and all that, and when I came out, some press guy had asked what me What were you about, all chatting about? Well, we were talking about, uh, you know, desegregating the, the, the state capitol facilities and, okay. you know, a little, little banner back and forth. Of course, he wasn't at you all know, forthcoming mm -hmm. on the matter. He was, he was very adamant that, uh, you know, Segregation wasn't always going to be the case, as long as he was governor and all that. You know. uh, and I don't remember exact words that were exchanged beyond those that I mentioned. But um, when I came out, um, some press guy asked uh, about the encounter, and I was telling them about it and some things that were said. And, uh, and I, I said, I used the word that uh, I was I was pleased that the governor had condescended to meet with us. Well, that was the thing that the governor took offense to. That, that, I, that, that he, I, I categorize his seeing us as a condescension. I don't, why do you say that? You know, there's, there's citizens of the state of Georgia. You know, I wouldn't condescend to meet them. You know, that would call me quite my surprise why he would. You know, we were talking about big issues like uh, you know desegregating facilities, and he just hung up on my categorizing to me as a condescension. Um, but uh, we thought that was uh, that was a success that we were able to get there. Uh, to the to the capital and to meet with him. In subsequent times, we did take small groups down and uh, and get into the capital with picket signs uh, hidden and and in the galleries and all, and folks would be thrown out. And remember, Ruby Dari Smith and, and the Franks and all were particularly out about pushing that that issue, and and, um, and some were arrested on the state grounds because of it. The issue of what now? Desegregation of the state oh, okay. capital. Okay. And, uh, of the facilities of the state. Well, on that first time when you did get a chance to see the governor, did you eventually go ahead and join the other part of the demonstration at the church? You know, I don't remember what happened beyond that point. I think we did, though. I think we, we got the word as to where they went, and then we went over and, and joined them. Uh, but it was a long time, uh, Lonnie tells me, before he realized that we had done that. 
it was a long time later that, that he realized that he had done that. So I don't know. I can't, uh -huh. I can't remember. Okay. But one of the other things we got involved with doing uh, during my time was the uh, the Grady Hospital initiative, which you may be aware of. Uh, there was a uh, local black dentist named Roy Bell who uh, decided to take on segregation at, at Grady Hospital. Grady was, of course, always a public facility um, run by the by Atlanta and Fulton County, and uh, I suppose the Cab County at the time. I think it was always the Atlanta Fulton to Cab Hospital Authority. Um, well, Fulton to Cab Hospital Authority, not Atlanta, not City of Atlanta, and it was fully segregated. Uh, they had segregated uh, facilities for the staff and all that, and segregated uh, uh, clinics and, um, and uh, beds and everything for patients, and uh, no black doctors on, on the staff. And uh, so uh, Bell decided to take that on. He couldn't get a whole lot of support elsewhere in the community, and, uh, and came to us, and uh, we manned picket lines with him for quite a period of time um, uh, on Grady. Uh, usually very few of us at a time. There would be maybe six or eight of us down there picketing Grady over a period of some months. We did uh, get uh, a meeting with the um, administrator at the time, who was named Pinkston, I think. Um, and much to our surprise, when we got there for this negotiation with him, uh, he had brought Daddy King in. Uh, and uh, Daddy King was there, and, and I had uh, Bell and myself and somebody else from our negotiating team. And so we were pressing our, our issues, you know, for uh, blacks on the staff, black doctors on the staff, and desegregation facilities and all that. And, and we were just going on and on, and the guy was, you know, just trying to be polite and not do anything. And we were pushing a little harder. And, and uh, finally, Daddy King jumped up and, you know, wait a minute. You don't kick a man when he's down. You made your point. I did, you know, and went on and on, scolding us in front of, in front of this man. And uh, so uh, Pinkston, uh, I, you know, thanked uh, Reverend King and said he would call on him for a benediction. And we had a little prayer and dismissed the meeting. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> what about the uh, sit-in at First Baptist Church? I was not a part of that. What would have happened later yeah. after you? Well, I can't remember it's exactly what point. In 63? Mm -hmm. Okay, I was no Spring longer chairman at that time. Yeah. Okay. Who was yeah, the chairman? I was succeeded by, um, and I forget the order, there were two guys, uh, Ralph Moore mm -hmm. and Larry Fox, and I don't remember which of them succeeded me directly and which succeeded mm -hmm. the other. Um, but Lonnie King uh, told me just recently that uh, David Satcher told him that he was the last chairman of, of, uh, of the committee. And neither one of us knew that. <laughs> so you may want to talk to him. I because say, because I, interview him. Yeah, uh, I, neither of us have talked to him about uh, what happened yeah. to his, uh, his service. So was the, the sit-ins at Shippahoy and S&W and Lebs and Morrison's, was that after your time? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, that was with, uh, with Larry or, or Ralph Moore. Uh, the Lebs thing got to be rather uh, notorious. And what is the story, even if it's secondhand from you? I, I can't mm. get well, handle I don't, on what that I was. I don't remember all that happened, except that, that Lev was very, uh, very adamant that he was not going to have these folk in there. And there was uh, some physical contacts, you know, uh, as I understand it, and, uh -huh. and police also kind of pushed people around. Uh, but uh, this is old recollection of secondhand information. Uh -huh. okay. But he made allegations, uh, like one of the students urinated on his floor and all kind of Mm -hmm. Stuff like that. So mm -hmm. It was just kind of a messy thing down there. Yeah. But I was not involved. In hindsight, what do you think the whole impact of the um, Atlanta student movement was on Atlanta mm -hmm. and elsewhere? Well, there's several things I would say about that. One, uh, in terms of impact, Ivan Allen was quoted as saying, um, I heard him say on um, more than one occasion, that the three most important things that have happened in Atlanta's history were the Partners for Progress Agreement, which was the arrangement between the city and the county as to which would pro pro provide which services. You know, the county would do health, the city would do public safety, etc. Uh, the other was the Forward Atlanta Campaign, which was a major campaign by the city, of Atlanta, by the Chamber of Commerce to promote Atlanta uh, to the outside world. And the, uh, the Atlanta Student Movement. Uh, he said that those three 
things were the most important things that happened in Atlanta. Um, now, in terms of category, categorizing what we did, I think it's, it's, it's most important to underline the fact that this was a very broad spread movement, that there were literally tens if not hundreds of thousands of people involved, most of whom you'll never know who they were, most of whom I don't know who they were, but they participated in so many different ways. There were some who were directly involved, as adults I'm talking about in particular. Um, they would fix food for us and bring it to us. They would provide transportation. Uh, they bailed us out of jail. You know, they sent in their credit cards. They honored the boycotts and the picket lines. Um, they made donations. Um, and this was just many, 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 many people. And that's what made the success of the movement. Not that there were a few people making speeches or a few people working on picket lines, but that they, the broad community bought into um, this vision and this dream of uh, the, the time is now for equality um, for the, among the races, between the races, there were only two of us at the time, anybody ever talked about. <laughs> um, and uh, that, that was the most important factor for us to remember and I think it's often forgotten. And another thing was that um, our focus, I think, was uh, perhaps too limited uh, and um, I regret that very much, that we never really spent as much effort on economic issues as we should have, economic opportunity. Um, not just employment, but also, you know, capital, um, um, yeah, capital investment and acquisition and, and the like. Uh, uh, that, that was one thing I, I regret, that we, we should have done more about that. Another thing that I regret is that um, we did not, as, our, as a generation of activists, did not make a point of passing on the legacy of our activism. Uh, to, uh, to our next generation. We, most of us probably didn't even talk about it very much with our own kids until they were, you know, well into their teens or something and they raised the question because they had read something or heard something mm -hmm. about it. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, so that we did not uh, ensure a continuing legacy of, um, of, of activist change. And I think, uh, you know, communities have suffered because of that. Uh, another positive thing, though, that I would, I would point out is that, um, as far as I know, the overwhelming majority of us who were directly involved in these efforts were involved for totally non-selfish reasons. It was something we thought was right to do, something that should be done, and we were willing to do it, and we did it, with no expectation that there would be any financial aggrandizement or, or any status coming of it or elective office coming out of it or any such thing. Um, and that was true of, you know, the overwhelming majority of the people that were involved as far as I know. Uh, I know it's true for me and, and all the folk that I knew. Uh, it only occurred to me last year that I could not remember when I first went to any of those places that I was involved in desegregating. It was probably many, many years later before I ever went to any of those places. So again, it wasn't a personal thing. And I, it may be true of a lot of others, I don't know. It just, I, it just hadn't occurred to me. You know, I don't know when I first went to the Magnolia. I think it was probably 20 some years later before I, I sat in the Magnolia room with the riches. Um, probably most of those places. Some of them earlier, I'm sure, but uh, I'd go to the theater. It just wasn't, it wasn't why I was doing those things. Um, and if you will look at the, the, uh, the leadership of the movements around the country, maybe it would be the, the same, but surely here, you would find that very few of the people who were the leaders and the activists uh, ran for public office. Uh, ben Brown did, he was from, uh, from Clark College. Julian Maughan did. Um, Frank Smith did in Washington, D.C., became a member of the city council. Um, I don't recall any of the ladies from Spelman. No, Carolyn Long Banks did uh, from, from Clark. She was on the city council. Um, but I don't. I would, I would dare say that uh, that was not anything in their minds at the time. It was something they were led to do later on. Mm -hmm. But that, to me, was very important, and it's something I just reflected on in recent years, mm -hmm. that there was that kind of uh, selfishness mm -hmm. that was involved. Mm -hmm. Another observation that I would make, which is a negative one, is that most of us, including myself, or maybe only me, I don't know, had no real sense of the history of what had gone before us, or what the people in Atlanta had done. Um, before us, we, we thought we were 
you know, well, I thought, I suppose, that we were uh, the first ones to be bold enough to confront racism, you know, uh, head on like that. And it was years later that I realized that people like John Calhoun to go into jail for refusing to give up the membership list for the NACP and, you know, the bus boycotts they'd had and all the other things that they'd done. Uh, I should have known all that. And uh, I guess it's my fault, but it's also the fault of the education that we got or didn't get mm -hmm. in our public schools and in the colleges as well. Mm -hmm. uh, coming through, I just, didn't, I just didn't know those things, and I, and, mm -hmm. I, and I feel that I should have. And uh, the sad part about